Good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm Vivek. Uh, thanks a lot, Chris, for, for the introduction. Uh, and thanks, everyone, for coming here uh, in, right in between the long weekend. Uh, so today, I'm going to talk about scaling blockchains to physical limits. Uh, this is joint work with four wonderful collaborators, uh, Shreera, David, uh, who is sitting right there, Julia, and Pramod. So uh, 10 years back, uh, Bitcoin was launched. Uh, and uh, over the last 10 years, Bitcoin has facilitated uh, transactions worth billions of dollars. And uh, it has shown the world that one can actually have a truly digital currency maintained in a decentralized fashion. It has gone. <coughs> over various ups and downs, but, but the system has been very, very secure. And uh, at the core of this Bitcoin protocol is, is consensus, where people uh, reach an agreement among themselves on who owes or uh, who, who owns how much Bitcoin. So if I pay Chris 10 Bitcoin, that is going to be uh, registered onto the Bitcoin ledger and everyone will come to an agreement. Uh, so, and over the last 10 years, we've seen that it's performed very well. And uh, five years back, uh, Ethereum uh, was launched. And uh, the idea behind Ethereum is, well, Bitcoin is so successful. Uh, and uh, what they did was they took the same consensus protocol. And instead of agreeing on just transactions, they said, why not? agree on snippet of codes, right? Why just limit yourself to Alice paid Bob and so on? Why can't we just agree on codes? And this uh, idea was, uh, was very uh, important. It was the next step uh, in the field of blockchain. And uh, it has allowed people to write various smart contracts. Smart contract is nothing but a piece of code. Uh, and uh, that has flourished lots of new applications uh, in this field, and Ethereum has also been quite successful in the last five years. So, uh, like any engineer, once you see a system which has run, in, which is which has run in the real world for five to ten years, uh, you start measuring the performance of such a system. And uh, the first uh, most important performance is uh, how secure is the system, right? This is this is maintaining a financial <coughs> ledger. So, the first most important uh, property of such a system is security and the system is 50% secure. What does this mean? It means that it can tolerate an adversary which controls up to 50% of the hash power, or the computation power. So this is quite good. <coughs> now that we have a very, very secure system, let's talk business, transaction. So let's talk about how many transactions can the system support. And uh, Bitcoin can support up to 10, 7 to 10 transactions, Ethereum 20, 25 transactions per second. It's good, but it's not enough to support the whole world. In fact, this won't even support maybe California. So this property, uh, so Bitcoin and Ethereum are quite poor when it comes to their transaction support. And uh, next, the important property is latency. That is, how much time does it take for a transaction to be confirmed? So when I go to a coffee shop, swipe my card, it takes five seconds before the barista hands over the coffee. But in Ethereum and Bitcoin, it takes hours before your transaction is confirmed. And hence, uh, that's the reason no one is ordering coffee using Bitcoin and Ethereum. I'm not certain that you would normally wait hours for Ethereum, but... Uh, I'll make it more clear once we go. Okay. Yeah, everyone waits for six blocks, 30 blocks, but that's, that's a very... It's a thumb rule. Okay. So from this, it's, the, the, it's quite evident that these systems are very <coughs> secure, whereas it has very poor throughput and latency properties. So as uh, Chris mentioned, the principal challenge of this field is scalability. And every two or three months, we have new articles out there talking about scalability and uh, solutions and different problems. And uh, I'm just going to list a few of them uh, so Bitcoin was the first uh, blockchain, and then we had Ethereum, and then we had a few more blockchains. 
and each of them have uh, tried uh, to improve the performance of, of a blockchain. Uh, and uh, so I'm not plotting the different security and decentralization properties of the different blockchains. Uh, but uh, <coughs> so the question is, how far can we go? That is, uh, sorry. How far can we go? Is Algorand, does, does it achieve the optimal throughput and latency? Does Thundercoin achieve optimal throughput and latency? So how far can we go? Is it 20 transactions per second, 200, 2 million? So when do we know that we've reached the optimum? Uh, so for that, we have to look at the physical limits. We know that these are real systems running on the internet. And hence, the physical limits will be imposed by the internet itself. And the first important parameter is the network capacity. So if users have 20 megabit links amongst themselves, then you can have at most transactions, your throughput is at most 20 megabits per second. Because if a transaction has to reach every user, every user in the blockchain, then you can at most push 20 megabits worth of transaction. And the second important parameter is speed of light propagation delay. <coughs> that is, if, if users are connected uh, amongst each other such a way that the delay of message is up to one second, then uh, latency of the system is at least one second because, uh, well, I have to transmit the transaction, it has to reach everyone else before we reach, uh, agree on it. So, uh, so if you plot uh, both the <coughs> physical limits imposed by the system, we see that none of the currencies are actually reaching there. And uh, the, the big question is, can we design a blockchain protocol which enjoys maybe I can take questions could you, yeah. could you put numbers on these axes? numbers? yeah uh, so capacity is 20 megabits per second okay. and uh, speed of light <coughs> delays like one second and what about those other points? Uh, I, I didn't put numbers uh, they have different claims so so this is an order of magnitude slower, like twice slower, 10% slower? <laughs> the difference? Uh, they don't reach the network capacity. Let me just put it down. By a factor of 10, by a factor of 100, 1,000? Oh, they, they uh, so the, the algorithms don't scale with network capacity. So today, if I just network capacity, I'm not sure the okay. throughput of all these algorithms will double. Is it clear? Well, no, that's one answer. Um, uh, so, this, so this is the question we, we want to tackle in this talk, which is, can we design a blockchain which achieves the physical limit and still maintain the strong uh, security of Bitcoin and Ethereum? And in this work, what we do is uh, we, construct the de we deconstruct the Nakamoto protocol, that is, the consensus protocol uh, the Bitcoin is running on. We deconstruct it, and then we scale it to obtain PRISM, and uh, PRISM <coughs> we scale it to obtain prism which obtain which achieves physical limits okay uh, so a small premiere on how Nakamoto protocol works uh, so the blockchain starts with a genesis block say all of us are miners uh, and all of us start with this block and all of us start mining on the longest chain okay and since we just have one block everyone is mining here and say Chris uh, mines the first block and uh, he sends it to everyone. And now all of us are mining on the first block, I mean on the second block, uh, because you have to mine on the longest chain. And say uh, my roommate from South America <coughs> mines the second block, and then my mom mines the third block, and so on. So what happens is everyone is mining on the longest chain, and uh, the ledger uh, is nothing but the transactions on the longest chain. <coughs> Okay, I'm sure most of you know how this works. Uh, and uh, if you fix the block size, say one megabyte, then it's very easy to see that the throughput is proportional to your mining rate. In Bitcoin, the mining rate is one block every 10 minutes. So your throughput is 10 me one megabyte every 10 minutes. And because these systems have very low mining rate, uh, the throughput is low. 
So this is the reason why Bitcoin and Ethereum have such low throughput. Okay, so we've tackled the we've we've understood why Bitcoin and Ethereum, which run the same protocol, suffer from low throughput. So now let's go to latency. That is, uh, so say I give you 0.1 Bitcoin for a coffee, and uh, say the transaction goes uh, onto a block. And say you immediately give me the coffee, saying, hey, I've seen the transaction. You've given me 1.1 Bitcoin. <coughs> so, but what I did was I owned 30% of the mining power. And as, as an adversary, I was mining two blocks in private. I was trying to mine blocks in private. And uh, even though I didn't own, even though the main chain had 70% hash power, because mining is stochastic in nature, I was lucky enough to get two blocks. And once you give me the coffee, I'm going to just uh, publish these blocks uh, to the public. And uh, now everyone starts mining on the blocks I mined because that's where the longest chain is. And uh, this is uh, then everyone starts mining on this. And what happens is your transaction is no longer part of the longest chain, and hence it's out. So lesson number one, don't immediately confirm your transaction because mining is stochastic in nature. Uh, so what do we do? Uh, this, was, this was in uh, Satoshi's paper where mm -hmm. you don't confirm the transactions immediately, but you wait till your transaction is k blocks deep. And uh, the reason you wait you, uh, is because the longer you wait, the fluctuations of mining is averaged out. And uh, if I'm an adverse, and then you confirm once your transaction is k blocks deep. And as an adversary, even if I mine in private, I'll not be able to overtake the longest chain because uh, the expectations have hit the system. <coughs> and say I release these blocks, no one is going to care about these blocks, and uh, you get to keep your point on Bitcoin. So what's happened here, instead of confirming it on one deep, we wait for k blocks, because the longer you wait, the fluctuations of mining are averaged out. And uh, so this was the, this is, uh, the table from Satoshi's paper where uh, you can see that as you wait for more and more blocks, the chance of your block, or the chance of your transaction being removed from the ledger decreases. And this is just law of large numbers, okay? Uh, yes. So, quick question: How does uh, how do you know you're mining on the largest uh, chain? You maintain a local copy of of the Bitcoin or blockchain, mm -hmm. and uh, you just mine on the longest chain, and you hope and your the assumption. Like, I guess I'm saying like if someone mined like two blocks in private and someone <laughs> else mined like five blocks in mm -hmm. private, and they both release them, like like how do you know that you just like, like, how do you know there's not someone, like, there's another one out there that's, like, 10 blocks that, that you just haven't <coughs> seen yet? Like, the client, you know, the client like yes. gets broadcast. Uh, yes, how so does it know? Does it just pick the longest one that it's seen in yes. this period of time? You pick the longest one you have right now. Okay. And if you see a longer chain, even though you've been mining on the first block, you actually change. You, change. you have to change. Uh, and the reason, like, the assumption is uh, there is no one... Like that, no one has fifty percent of the mining power, so uh, there is no chain which is longer and uh, private. It can happen for a short duration, but it cannot happen for a long duration. Uh, so let's plot these. Uh, so before we plot, uh, the mining rate of Ethereum is one block every fifteen seconds, and uh, now if you uh, add one and one, you see that to get 10 raised to minus six error rate, that is, you have to wait 50 blocks deep, and that would correspond to two hours. So this answers your question on why one has to wait for a long time to actually uh, confirm the transaction with good error. Uh, <clears throat> but, and just to be clear, you, I guess you're some, the, these numbers that you're putting up here, I guess they're, because they came from the Bitcoin paper, they're kind of blockchain agnostic. So they, uh, 
So any blockchain which uses the longest chain of the Nakamoto protocol. Right. So I'm not certain anybody is waiting 50 blocks on yeah, that's Bitcoin. It. Yeah, that's right. Okay, so it, I, I mean, it feels slightly, <coughs> anyway, it, it's completely minor, but it would just feel slightly funny to be going for two hours on Ethereum if you're not going to ever do it on Bitcoin. <laughs> <coughs> so the reason people are not waiting is because like, they, they're taking the risk. Okay, okay. So you're 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 holding Ethereum to a higher bar. I, I like that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's also, of course, Ethereum Classic had the 51 just recently, so a lot of exchanges now are demanding 30, uh, 36 uh, blocks. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. So it depends also on the price, how much you're putting in. Some some exchanges will will okay out a smaller number. They'll go as low as six on Ethereum. Okay, great. It's, it's it's completely minor. Thank you. Yeah. So let's plot uh, the trade-off between latency and error. And uh, we can see that latency is inversely proportional to one over the mining rate F. Because if you want to get uh, 10 days to minus six security, you have to wait for K over F uh, time. And uh, what we want, as Chris pointed out, is we want a much better trade-off between latency and uh, the error. So let's just try a solution of increase the mining rate F. And uh, let's hope that you get a much better trade-off. Uh, and uh, <coughs> we've seen in a couple of slides, uh, a few slides back, that throughput was also proportional to mining rate. So in front of us, we have two problems which actually could be solved using the same solution, right? How rare is it that you have two problems in life which have the same solution? So what do you think? Mining rate, just increasing mining rate, uh, do you think it would work? Any any guesses? Chris? No. Well, I mean, there, there are problems with increasing your mining rate, but uh, of okay. course. Let's see. So what happens? Uh, you increase your mining rate. So this is how a typical slow blockchain would look like. But as you increase your mining rate, it, uh, it becomes a block mess. Uh, <laughs> the reason you have this complicated structure is because if you increase your mining rate to say one <coughs> block every millisecond, all the blocks which are mined within the network delay of each other will not know each other. And hence, they cannot be mined over each other. So all the blocks mined within the network delay are mined uh, parallelly. So all the increase in mining rate actually just increases the width of, of your blockchain. It doesn't contribute a lot to the length of the blockchain. And moreover, uh, as you increase the mining rate, the security of the system drops shortly. So not only you've failed at increasing throughput and latency, but you've also reduced the security of the system, right? So the simple solution of increasing mining rate doesn't work. But uh, maybe we should just change the protocol. You know, why stick to longest chain protocol? It was just <coughs> envisioned by one particular person. And in fact, there has been a lot of work in this direction, a lot of very interesting <coughs> ideas, where they have tried constructing the ledger, not using the longest chain, but using the volume of, of my block. So, you don't reuse the chain to reach consensus, but you try to use the whole volume. And uh, in fact, number of transactions per block. What do you mean by volume? No, volume is like you know, all the blocks. Like in the longest chain, you would just probably care about this chain. You would not uh, consider the blocks. The uncles. The uncle blocks. Yes. Okay. And in fact, Ethereum has implemented a version of Ghost in their. Uh, <coughs> in that protocol. And uh, it turns out that the first three protocols out there, uh, actually, they are not secure. Uh, there is this attack called the balance attack, which, uh, which actually, <coughs> which using which you can actually destroy the security of the system. And turns out that balance attacks uh, are very effective against all the blockchains which use volume instead of the length as the way to reach consensus. So all these ideas, when you, read, uh, when you read, it looks like a very simple fix. But it turns out that uh, in this field, 
like coming up with ideas and proving them is, is very important else we might end up losing the security of the system. Could you quickly explain what, what volume means here? Oh, volume, uh, so in longest chain what you would do is you would agree on the longest chain and you would not consider the fact that there are blocks mined off right. the chain, right? But maybe you would like to construct your ledger uh, using blocks which have a lot of uncle blocks around. A lot of uncle blocks. These are called the uncle blocks. And in the Ethereum, since we are at the Ethereum meetup. Uh, so in, in, in Bitcoin, these blocks would not help you. But maybe you can use these blocks and uh, this will <coughs> prevent the adversary from, from, launching, from launching private attacks. Which is the number of connections. Number of connections, yes. So that's what <coughs> I mean by volume and just not the length. Uh, any questions here? Uh, so when you're talking about the rate, or, or I guess F, is F your rate? Mining rate, yes. But 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 my mining rate, you, you probably like say the number of blocks per time. Is that right? Yeah. But I guess you know some people would get excited about increasing the, the number of transactions per block. I guess is that something that you that would that's increasing the the rate of transactions per second. Yeah. So there have been a lot of solutions where they say, well, let's keep the mining rate to one block every fifteen seconds, but let's make the block. Okay. And what that effectively does is it increases your network delay of transmitting the block. And it's as it's equivalent of increasing the mining. Okay. So it's the same mathematically. Oh yes. Um, who's to determine what percent of security is acceptable or not? Uh, yes, good question. So <coughs> that's the reason uh, Bitcoin chose a very, very small mining rate. Because <coughs> they chose one block every 10 minutes, and if you actually put numbers in, you get security of 49.5. So that's the reason the mining rate was chosen very small. And I guess 49 is, is a good number to begin. What's the intuition behind the balance attack? Uh, I'll talk to you offline about that. That's, uh, that's a little, that'll be a big digression. So, so what we've seen is uh, just increasing the mining rate doesn't work the longest chain protocol fails. And just tweaking the protocol because you want higher mining rate also doesn't simply work. So let, let's go back to the physical limits because we started with physical limits. <coughs> We're mining with one block every 15 seconds and this corresponds to 25 kilobytes per second uh, of uh, throughput. And in 1994, the year I was born, we already had modems which supported this throughput. But today we are thousand times to ten thousand times we have more capacity and uh, looks like both these systems uh, are not using the capacity they are leaving a lot on the table in fact they're using less than 0.1 uh, percent of their bandwidth right so the conclusion is these protocols are the performance of these protocols is limited by their algorithm and not by the physical limits of the system right so what we do is uh, Instead of directly scaling, we deconstruct the Nakamoto protocol and then scale. Okay, so so in, in Nakamoto protocol, you just have one unit of message that is the block, but turns out that this block actually plays multiple roles. Uh, the two main roles are proposing and voting. So consider the first block. Uh, this block is adding a few transactions into the ledger. So it's proposing and new transactions into the ledger. And all its children blocks are making sure that this transaction is part of the longer chain. So it's voting this transaction. So from this transaction's point of view, the first block is playing the role of proposing. And the next four blocks are playing the role of voting. OK? Uh, whereas uh, from the second transaction's point of view, this block is playing the role of proposing, and the next three blocks are playing the role of voting. So you can see that every block is performing these two roles. Uh, what we do in PRISM uh, is uh, instead of 
uh, maintaining one block structure which uh, <coughs> performs both these roles, we actually separate these two roles out. And uh, the structure would look something like this. And uh, going from Nakamoto to Prism is, is a big jump. So what we'll do is uh, we'll first deconstruct Nakamoto. Uh, that is, we'll obtain, we will, we'll come up with a new protocol which decouples these two roles of proposing and voting uh, such a way that we still maintain the of the system. We've seen that just tweaking the protocols by a small amount can potentially destroy the security of the system. So this is the goal of uh, <coughs> deconcept in Nakamoto. So what we'll do is we will maintain two blockchains or two different structures. Uh, and every, every full node or every miner will store both uh, these structures. And the functionality of the left structure, uh, or your right, yeah, the right structure is uh, <coughs> Proposing and the functionality of sorry, did I get it wrong? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> functionality of the left structure is proposing, and the right structure is voting. And uh, the votes are, are will be represented using these links. Uh, and the way to vote a block is just by including the hash of the block. Okay. So uh, we'll be calling this as voter tree and uh, proposer tree, and we'll be calling the other structure as voter tree. So how does this protocol work? mining. So this is same as Bitcoin. Every user is mining on both the chains and is following the longest chain principle. Okay, so this is same as Bitcoin. And content. What do these blocks contain? They contain the transactions. Uh, so the proposed block contains the transactions, which is uh, same as Bitcoin. And the voter block, uh, let me just read that out for you. Uh, this is the new addition to this protocol because we've explicitly removed voting we'll have to tweak the protocol by a small <coughs> mount so every vo every voter block votes on one proposer block every level so level one two three four five which have not been voted by its ancestors so this is the voting room i have a few animations which will clarify this voting room so let, let's start uh, how <coughs> this how this blockchain would evolve. So in, in Bitcoin, all of us just mine one block. But here, because we are mining two blocks, uh, what we do is we, we, may, we mine a super block. So we construct a super block, uh, which contains the parent of both uh, the block structures, and which contains the content of both the block structures. right? So in Bitcoin, you just had your parent and the transaction. But here you have parent one, parent two, content one, content two. And then you start mining. That is, you take a nonce and you start hashing. And if the hash is less than the threshold, you get a proposer block. And if the hash is between threshold and two threshold, you get a voter block. And the threshold is chosen such a way that each chain is growing slowly. So we are still in the slow regime. Just imagine two Bitcoin chains growing slowly, and they're interacting amongst themselves. I'm so fuzzy. Tell, tell us what you're hashing. What is it that the hash is over? Hash is over the parent, parent one, parent two. But the content of the block is? And content one and content two, both. And then the nonce. The content is not the same? The, the different blocks, you see the first, Proposer block has transactions as its content. And the second, uh, voter blocks, they have votes as their content. Now, I, I don't know if mining is a proper term. I think validating would be better. And my, my, my question, though, is if you've got, let's say, let's say an even dozen validators that are doing this, yeah. the bandwidth, I think, it starts to play a part because now we have to communicate our states constantly as to know which one is the correct you know, chain. So it's like just maintaining two chains. No, but we have to communicate between all 12 of us what we currently see with regard to our ledgers. Yeah, so this, I'm talking, uh, so this is a protocol which you run locally. So locally, you mine on the longest chain, and locally you include all the transactions you know of, and you follow this voting policy. But how do I know I'm on the 
the chain with the most work. Yeah, so this is same as Bitcoin. This is assuming that you have a good internet connection and you're connected to the right peers, you are like, yeah, you have the latest blockchain. Both of these are growing very slowly. But would I have to communicate my, my ledger and the other ledgers that the other nodes see? Uh, it's, it's the same as Bitcoin. Even in Bitcoin, you, you never really know that you're mining on the longest chain. You do. Yeah. You are kind of, I think, trading between latency and hash rate because uh, the latency grows. Yeah, but how do I know I'm on not a partition the, that I haven't been partitioned from the network? Uh, so, so this is why the latency. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Grow. Right. But we, we still have to pass, you know, know what where, which the other nodes see. <coughs> so every time a new block is mined, it's like beamed out on the network. And you just hope that you receive it and then. If you're mining on a block and you get a longer one, like you abandon that and start on the longest one. Yeah, but on this one, you have two. You have two. It's like mining on Ethereum and Bitcoin. There are miners who do both. Of course, so we're not talking about the computation part of it. <coughs> yeah. I think that's easy. Let's, uh, <coughs> let's let Vivek yeah. go on and hopefully we can rewind <coughs> at the end. Yeah. OK. So let's let's start. How would this blockchain typically proceed? Say the first block mind is a proposal block, and the next block mind is a voted block. So according to the rule, you have to vote on all the levels not voted by your ancestors. Uh, your ancestor has not voted on, a, on any level, and there's only one level, so you just vote on level one. Then you have say a proposal block. It grows on the longest chain. You have a voter block which also grows on the longest chain, but this voter block uh, only votes on level two because its ancestor has already cast its vote on level one. And say the <coughs> next block is a voter block because this this mining procedure doesn't ensure you that you're going to get one proposal and one voter. In fact, it is both these chains are evolving independently. Now, this voter block is not casting any vote because well, its ancestors are voted on all the levels. And uh, next, say suppose you have two proposal blocks. Uh, now the fourth voter block has to vote both on level three and level four. So this is how the blockchain evolves. Uh, and uh, so now that we know how mining is done, we will try to construct a ledger from, from this uh, structure. And for this ledger, I don't need the parent-child link between the proposal blocks, I'm just going to remove them. Uh, they're present, but we are not just conceptually we're going to remove them. So this is the rule. Select the votes along the longest chain. See, the word longest chain again appears. So select the vote along the longest chain. So this is, sorry. Select the votes along the longest voter chain. So uh, this is the longest voter chain. There is no other computation. And we select uh, the votes along the longest voter chain. And then we order the proposal blocks by the votes. So it, it looks very complicated, right? Instead of just eating food like this, you're just twisting your hand and eating food. But this is what it's doing. Select the longest voter chain and order the proposal blocks according to the voter chains. And uh, this is my ledger. OK? Uh, and how would a confirmation policy look? We again have the same K-deep confirmation policy. How do you confirm this transaction? Well, all you have to make sure is the vote, the voter block which is voting on this proposal block stays in its longest chain. And since this is just running Bitcoin protocol, the same uh, security guarantees are directly translated. Okay. So what we've done is we've taken Nakamoto protocol, we've decoupled it, but we've maintained the security of, of the system. But however, this has not really increased the throughput because you can see that this chain is still growing very slowly. And we've not really improved on latency because you still need K-deep confirmation policy. So yes. before you go on, when a vote block votes on a proposal block, what does that mean? It includes the checksum of that? It just includes the hash, yes. OK, so when I mine a <coughs> block, um, I need to know all the proposal blocks that, that are available up to that point. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, and so 
if I've already mined a voting block for all the available proposal blocks, I don't need another voting block at that point. You mean because like that, that would just be useless to me, right? Like in this example, right? So why did I bother to, to mine a new voting block? It increases the security of the it other. Security of that one. Okay. And you get rewards. Okay. <coughs> okay. So uh, what so now now that we've deconstructed the Nakamoto protocol, uh, the next step is scaling the protocol. And uh, one thing we know is we just can't increase in the mine. We can't increase the mining rate because we we'll go back or we'll fall <coughs> into the same situation we've seen before. So instead of increasing the mining rate, I will just increase the number of water trees. Okay. So instead of having one water tree, I will have a thousand water trees. And each tree. Or so each tree or a chain? Chain tree. Chain, uh, yeah. chain this yeah. was also bothering me uh, by, by using tree. Technically, it could be a tree, but yeah, chain. Technically, you don't want a tree. Yeah, okay, water chain. Let's call it water chain. Uh, <coughs> so each water chain is being mined very slowly, but you have a thousand of them being mined. Okay? And uh, each of them is following the same mining policy and content policy of deconstructed Nakamoto. So uh, they vote on one proposal block every uh, level. So from this proposal block's point of view, the rate at which it's getting votes has suddenly increased by a factor 1,000. Right? Before it was one, <coughs> one vote per, say, 10 minutes or 15 seconds, but now it's, it's at a very high rate. And uh, the ledger construction changes slightly. That is, uh, for each level, you choose a proposal block with maximum number of votes. Right? And if you reduce this to one chain, this ledger construction is the same as the previous one. And uh, turns out that now that you have this system, you can actually confirm this proposal block or transactions in this proposal block <coughs> when your votes are just a constant deep. So you don't have to wait for each vote getting k deep into the chain, but each vote just being a constant deep is good enough. In fact, uh, in this situation, if each vote will remain in the chain with, say, 60% guarantee, then you can be sure with very high <coughs> confidence that more than 500 votes will not be reverted. Is this clear? So what we are doing is, instead of just taking average over time, we are taking average over space and time. Uh, and uh, turns out that <coughs> the latency and error trade-off uh, drastically improves. And uh, in fact, the slope, uh, if you remember, in Nakamoto protocol was 1 over f, uh, just f is a constant, because you are getting one vote at the rate of f. But in PRISM, you can get 1,000 votes, or the, the limit is just the capacity of the system. So you can actually get, say, votes proportional to the capacity of the system. And uh, that directly translates to a much better latency and error uh, trade-off. And now let's bring in uh, the lower bound of latency. And uh, once you chop off these uh, plots because you need at least need uh, d seconds to communicate. It turns out that <coughs> uh, Nakamoto pr prism has much better uh, trade-off than Nakamoto. And in fact, this point, the error uh, is has a very special property, uh, which is 1 over the error is proportional to CD, which is called the bandwidth delay product. And uh, this quantity CD it's just a very important quantity in the field of networking where this kind of tells you how many packets do you have in your network if you take a snapshot. So, and you can see that this is, is a quite, it's a very large number, or it's a very small number. Error rate could be like 10 raised to minus 20, 10 raised to minus 30, and you can still, uh, and you have to still wait only for D or order D seconds to, to get such low error rate. Whereas in Nakamoto, you have to wait for much longer time. 
So this is uh, how we scale the latency and we get near optimal latency. And uh, now let's come back to throughput. So <coughs> in this system, the throughput is still uh, given by the proposal tree. And because this is growing very, very slowly, you still have very low throughput. Uh, and if you remember, the way we solved the latency problem was decoupling two aspects of, of a clock. So since that trick worked once, let's, let's do it again. And uh, here what we do is we decouple uh, the proposing or adding transaction part and leader election part. So now instead of mining just two kinds of blocks, you mine transaction blocks in a pool at a very, very high rate. And the leader blocks just refer these transaction blocks. Okay, So if you go back to this picture, every proposer block could get 1,000 transactions in. But now, every proposer block can refer to 1,000 transaction blocks, which themselves have 1,000 transactions. And that directly increases your throughput by a factor 1,000. And turns out that this uh, can scale the throughput of the system all the way up to capacity of the system. And what has happened is we've deconstructed Nakamoto into three parts. Uh, the colors are not quite visible, but we've deconstructed into transaction, proposing, and voting. And uh, this part gives you the throughput. The center part gives you the security, and the right part gives you the latency. So we maintain the security of Bitcoin, and we've scaled the throughput, and we've scaled the, or reduced the latency of the system. Uh, so the main result of, uh, so all of this is just good figures, but uh, what we've done is we've actually proved the properties of the system rigorously. And we've shown that if an adversary controls less than 50% of mining rate, uh, PRISM can confirm honest transactions with delay proportional to the network <coughs> speed of light propagation delay with a very, very small uh, error probability. And uh, it can achieve optimal throughput of 1 minus beta c, where beta is your adversarial power. And the adversary could just decide to include junk transactions. So that's the reason this is the best you can do. And PRISM, in fact, achieves this. And uh, you can find all these uh, results uh, rigorously proved uh, uh, on this paper, which is there in both ePrint and Archive. And uh, so what we've done is we've achieved optimal throughput. And uh, we've achieved delay, which is proportional to D. And uh, now the question is, well, you promised physical limits, you have just delivered physical limits for throughput. But what's the proportionality constant there? That we have some uh, simulations where we plot the latency uh, and of both Nakamoto and PRISM uh, for different adversarial powers. And we can clearly see that, uh, sorry, we can clearly see that you can confirm these transactions under a minute for PRISM, whereas for uh, Nakamoto, like Bitcoin and Ethereum, it would take you a uh, few hours. And uh, the conclusion is uh, PRISM provides a natural way to scale uh, the Nakamoto protocol to its physical limits. And because it's using a lot of components of Nakamoto's protocol, it easily inherits all the security properties of Nakamoto protocol, and it also inherits the incentive properties of of these protocol. And yeah, that's it. Uh, questions, yes. Um, do I still mine the um, transaction block or no? Yeah, 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 you do mine the transaction block. Why? It would seem like I would put out the proposal mm -hmm. block and um, just wait for people to vote on it and wait for it to get votes. So your question is, why would I mine transaction blocks? Because you get a reward. Each time you mine a transaction block, you say, hey, these are the 1,000 transactions. Why, why is it necessary? Could, could you say that again? I mean, <coughs> I thought there, there's a proposer. <coughs> I mean, you, you mine to get into the proposer uh, chain. blockchain or the voter chain. Or this one. 
Oh, that so the transaction block pool is a separate a reward? Separate. Yeah. <coughs> because you want to scale the transactions while maintaining the security. So let's say I have a new transaction. Yeah. So I put in the transaction block. Yeah. I wait to, to build up a thousand of them. Yeah. And then once I have a thousand, I put an entry into a proposal block. Yes. Right? Then once a proposal block gets a thousand, yeah. right, it becomes a proposal block. Mm. Okay? So then um, mm -hmm. I'm going to just wait to be, I publish it. I'll just wait for people to vote on it. Mm -hmm. And that's it. Why, why do you need to mine on the proposal tree? You have to simultaneously mine on all the three. So when, when you're mining a proposal tree, you can include transaction blocks mined by other users too. So this is how the mining process works. You mine on the longest chain of proposal tree, and you include all the transaction blocks which have not been included yet because that's how you bring them to the ledger. Okay. So if you just mine the proposal tree without the transaction blocks, the throughput is very low. No, no, what I mean is what I've only mined, uh, what I, if, only mi if I only mine the volume, yes. and have mined anything else, why does it not work? So what do you mean, why does it not work? So the system is designed to improve the throughput. Mm -hmm. If you just work on the voter and the proposal tree, the latency will be good, but the throughput will be low. So the system is designed to scale the throughput, right? So yeah. that's why we want people to generate many transaction blocks, and there'll be appropriate re reward for generating a transaction block. Not formulating my question correctly. Why is it necessary um, for any mining to be done on the, um, on the left part of the diagram? Why is it not sufficient to just mine the voter tree and make the voter tree secure? Proof of work. Is that what your friends are mining? I really don't think. I, I take umbrage at using Nakamoto consensus. This is more like a ghost LMD, if anything. LMD? The, 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 the latest message driven ghost protocol out of Ethereum. So, or maybe even like Tenderman? Yeah, do you, do you, do you <clears throat> I mean, I, I'm sure you guys are familiar with this, uh, like, uh, Byzantine consensus protocol. Yeah, yeah so right? this is, this is not Byzantine because this actually has liveness, whereas uh, Tendermint and other Byzantine protocols have safety. And because you're trying to grow on the longest chain of each of these structures, it's very, it's clearly different from Byzantine and hence Tendermint. So instead of K-deep or K-wide, uh -huh. right? That's right. But the question is, I mean, the best I think anyone's theoretically guesstimating with these shards is maybe 20 validators. And at some point, <coughs> the, the incentive just drops off. So you're never going to get 1,000. So, so one thing is, everyone is maintaining all the chains. This is, this is sharding is an orthogonal uh, aspect of the problem where you want to scale different performance metrics. Sure. So here everyone is maintaining all of them. Well, you're, you're expecting a thousand people, let's say, theoretically? or So everyone is mining on all of them, so it does, you, you don't need thousand different people. You could be one single person mining on everything. It's like just maintaining thousand... So in fact, maybe you can go back to the uh, block mess slide. So maybe here's one way of thinking about it. Right there. If you go back to the block mess slide, yeah, you see that the blocks, there are many blocks there, right? Because we're trying to increase the mining range. Yeah. So all these blocks are just mined so sort of naturally by network. So what we're doing is essentially we're trying to organize this block mess into a structure form. So that's basically what the whole point is. Because if it's so messy, it's hard to figure out how to sort of decipher the security. What we're doing is we're trying to create structure So yeah, the, yeah so if you, if you just scroll like forward those slides, uh, right there. So it's almost like merged mining. You're actually doing the same hash algorithm, and it's just because the solutions are different depending on what tree or chain you're talking about. Yes. And I'm assuming with the uh, the voter trees, it would be like you know, That's right. three, four, five, six. You're actually you, you can actually do all of the you can you can mine as many of these trees as you want. With the same hashing, that's right. It's this just happens that the solution space for each tree is different. So it's merged mining. It's basically the old-fashioned merged mining. You're mining 
multiple chains at the same time. Right? But you know what the issue I have then with that is? As, as somebody using this network to send a message, how do I know it's going to be you know, carried out? Because you have the capacity, right? We are not exceeding the capacity. So in Bitcoin, you just use 0.1% of the capacity, but here we are just filling the pipe. So the network is guaranteeing you that your blocks are going to be uh, seen by other users in some time. <coughs> so this is the merge mining you were yeah, talking so about. Another question, can you just describe for me on the proposal blocks, uh, how they're related to the, the transaction pool? Like, So each proposal block contains pointers to the transactions in the pool that it wants to Yes. Use? Okay. So when this proposal blocks get confirmed, all the transaction block it referred to also get confirmed. Okay. That's and how. And I'm mining the transaction. I could optionally mine whatever I wanted, but say, say I was mining everything. Okay? That's right. Because um, there's no penalty for mining everything. <coughs> the reward is maximized. I would mine the transaction tree or chain or pool rather, because I want to basically broadcast the transactions around. Yes. Yeah. Okay. The last question I had, which kind of confused me, so what I saw this as the, oh, okay, I know what he's going to do. I didn't see you like creating a thousand trees. What I thought you would do instead would be to tweak the, um, and maybe maybe you just can't do this for a lot of good reasons. I thought, well, the proposal trees, you know, need some size because you know originally you know, I thought they were the transactions. The voter trees are really small, so I right. just make that block time faster yes, and right. the block size smaller. And, it doesn't have to run at the same speed as the other, as, as the proposal tree. But then you have problems with security and stuff. So that like actually that. does help you increase the latency, but it's just a constant. It, okay. it doesn't scale with. It doesn't change anything. Really. Yeah, maybe like 10 times, but okay. not a thousand times that. Okay, I got it. That's so you scaling it horizontally is, is the right way to because go. Because you know that latency at the end of it is limited by the intra proposal block time. Ah. So that is limiting us. So even though we can speed up because the voter blocks are smaller, then it doesn't really help a few Is Is there an optimal, say for a given proposal uh, tree, is there an optimal number of like transaction blocks in the pool per proposal block? Is there an optimal number of voter trees per proposal block? So you, that, would, that would like optimize this, or is it just as many as possible? As many as, many as, many as possible, as possible yes. Okay. There's no upper. That, that's not right. the physical limits. Yeah. It's the physical limits. Is are there numbers attached to that? Real world numbers you, you attach to that? Like, it's best to have X voter trees. Let's say. So the la the more voter trees you have, the faster the, the less of the okay. latency. The closer, the closer you go. It's asymptotically gets closer to the physical limit. Yes. I see. Okay. That's interesting. What's the incentive, though? That's the question. Like, it, I mean, I agree, you have to have a lot, but what's the incentive to do this? You get rewards for each block you mine. Yeah, you get rewards. Coinbase or something? Coinbase reward. Like, well, but if there's like a thousand people yeah. for a piece of pie, right? But you but will be- bigger. Pie's not bigger <laughs> because we carry on higher transaction throughput. You say so each pie tree is a blockchain, so there's a thousand pies. No, I, I, yeah, but there's still, there's so much pie. I have, I, have a, I have a slightly related question. I mean, I hope I'm not intruding too much, but uh, one, <coughs> one thing, one word that I haven't heard, which is uh, decentralization. Huh. And, and specifically, I mean, one challenge with super high, I mean, I, I confess there, I'm, I might be missing something here because I have, there's lots of stuff I haven't caught mm -hmm. fully here, but at least I'm, I'm you know, one problem with super high throughput is you get a super massive blockchain and you the only guy that can run it is you, you gotta have a data center. You know, you get one node per data center. Is that where we're headed? I, I, I kind of, am I missing something here? Yeah, so two, there are two aspects of this question. The first thing is <coughs> throughput. You're getting, you're using 20 megabits, so almost everyone can. Everyone has 20 megabits of bandwidth. Um, yeah, I'm much. actually talking about the, um, the, the file, file storage. The file storage. storage. The storage. Yeah. The storage. <coughs> actually, didn't, um, isn't it also the case that the, the voter trees or chains, you want those to be as many different uh, people, nodes as possible, the miners, because otherwise you're also affecting the security in the end, isn't it? So everyone is mining on everything. So what 
happens is like you may mine on voter three, voter block, voter tree number three, and I'll mine on voter tree number two, and everyone is mining on every tree. To to just answer your question, that's that's a good question because uh, the history, because you're getting twenty megabits per second, you have to store tons and tons of uh, data, and uh, so. Yeah, like then you have to go to sharding. That is, can you make sure that uh, users can show can store fraction of this data and still maintain the security of the system? And that's where sharding enters. Well, you know, the issue is not really tied to Prism, right? Your question, because any high throughput scheme <coughs> would give it as public in some sense, right? Well, I mean, there's at least some things that I mean, you can at least imagine some. Uh, some checkpoints like the the the, uh, the Israeli Starkware like to talk about uh, building a proof for a group of transactions, and you just store the proof rather than yeah. all the transactions. I, I mean, maybe that's kind of an orthogonal that's solution, yeah. but I at least was I was just kind of curious to see what you guys had to say about this. Yeah. We can use zk snarks. We can use zk snarks over this. Well, I think this might have been a us. I don't <laughs> pretend to be a guru, but I thought these guys were talking about using the Starks. But yes, it's similar, yeah. similar tech. <coughs> yeah. Okay. And also, a lot of Bitcoin nodes they don't maintain the history; they just maintain the state, which is all the unspent coins. There are only few archival nodes which are maintaining all the transactions. So, what uh, increasing throughput will definitely increase your history by the same factor, but it would not increase your state by the same fact. So today you have 2 GB uh, size state, maybe it becomes 15 GB, but yeah, history is a problem. Yes? How do you set incentives so that people are mining equally on different things? That's, yeah, so what we do is, that's, in fact, the way the mining works is, you mine on all of them simultaneously. So you take <coughs> your block, you include all the parrots, you include all the contents, and then you start mining. And if your threshold, if, if your hash is between zero to threshold, then the block is a proposed block. Everyone can verify this. If it is between threshold and two threshold, it becomes a voter block. So in some sense, you're forcing everyone to split their mining power equally, both the honest users and the adversaries. So how does this work with the transaction? So you just have one more, <coughs> like from 101 threshold to some other threshold. So you're, you're kind of, the because the hash <coughs> is not reversible, it's just a one-way function, you can actually make sure that everyone is forced to split this. So if you just want to, say, mine on voter trees, what will happen is whenever you get a transaction block, you have to ignore it. But let's say like my hash is between T and 2T. <coughs> yes. So then the only block I actually introduce is that one. Yes, that's it. But I hashed like all those contents. Yeah, so we can actually, <coughs> that's a good question. So are we wasting a lot of bandwidth? I mean, is the block including a lot of useless content? And there are these ideas of Merkle trees where you can actually store the content in a Merkle tree and just include the root. And uh, mm -hmm. <coughs> you don't take any hit in the system. I, I, I didn't quite catch how that works <coughs> because you're, I mean, if you have a, I mean, are, aren't, aren't these are new new blocks that you're trying to include in the proposure? Oh, you, the proposure tree? <coughs> I mean, it's not in the Merkle tree yet, is it? So what we do is we take, say you are mining on <coughs> uh, thousands of 1001 parents. So instead of including all the parents in the block, what we do is we form a Merkle tree and we just include the Merkle root. Okay. Why right, mining? Right. But what was your question wasted computation and not bandwidth? Yes, that is his, his question is like, can an adversary just say, hey, I'll concentrate all my mining resources on voter chain one? How do you make sure that everyone splits it equally? And uh, by design, everyone has to split it equally. 
Yes, you, you had a question. Oh yeah. Um, <coughs> so uh, the storage question: are, are you really, are you really just, are you? So you're mining the transaction pool as if it were one of these trees. And so it's one of the solution spaces. Is is the, uh, the I, I guess the thing, the thing about the transaction pool that's a little different is that these <coughs> take a lot of capacity and space. I think. And um, if you were, if you were willing to go, like forego, is there any way, like there's no sort of, this is full node mining where you have to have the whole ledger, all of the trees mm -hmm. in the ledger. Like there'd be no way to just um, focus on proposer and voting and just take someone's word for the, the hash of a, of a transaction block because um, I don't have petabytes of storage at all. Like, uh, <coughs> so, you know what I mean? yeah, what people do is they don't store the history. Okay. Like, um, but you just store the state. So you just store all the coins which people own, but you don't store who to whom. And that's enough to be a full node. Okay. Uh, but in case of a 51% attack, well then you have to go back and so, so there's some sort of a, uh, is it like a <coughs> SPV, like a simple Yeah, you can have an SPV over it. Because, uh, yeah, the storage on the transaction block pool could be pretty heavy, right? Yeah, but I'm saying you don't store the blocks, you just store the state. Okay. So you yeah. cancel out all the... Right. right. I gave it to you and you... still mine on every tree in your farm. Yeah, that's... Okay. The, the, this is... The, even though this occupies half my slide, this actually is... is very... Uh, this has very low overhead. Yeah. Like we are implementing the system and most of the overhead in terms of storage, computation is all on transaction blocks. One thing I'm confused about is if you're, so say you're, mine, you're mining and your hash falls between whatever, like one and two or whatever, and it mm -hmm. corresponds to one of those voter trees, what do you, what do you do with that? Because the, the, the thing that you hashed, yeah. right, is, is all of the, content. is all of the content that includes the proposal <laughs> up and all the voter mm -hmm. blocks, right? But it, your hash is so. What do you actually broadcast, and what do you do with that? That once you once yeah. You so find it? what you do is uh, instead of including all the contents. Yeah. I am. I think Chris had a very similar question. Instead of including all the contents, <coughs> I will store the content in a Merkle tree. Are you familiar okay. with Merkle tree? Vaguely. Okay. So yeah. just imagine that you have this black box where you can actually store a lot of content, mm -hmm. and you get a root which is just thirty-two bytes. And uh, you can prove to everyone that once once you give this root, right. you can prove it to everyone else that you actually had the content without revealing other contents. So you can prove that the block that you're going to submit for that vote yeah. tree was in this sort of Merkle structure. Yes. Yes. So, but does that mean that that means that at that that everyone has to agree on that on the content that they're mining it on, right? Like, because if I'm mining, yeah, on like, and I'm hashing this content, yes, and I get, you know, and then I submit whatever, like one of these voter trees, I can prove that's in the content that I was mining. Yeah, you can do that on Merkle. And so, if for other people to care about that, it means that they're also mining on the same content. Is that correct? Uh, no, no. This is uh, you don't have to have the same content because you're just performing this operation locally. Right. So, in for example, in Bitcoin also, mm -hmm. the transactions you're including doesn't have to be the same transactions I'm including. You have to just ensure that all the transactions you're including are valid. That is, they have valid signatures. But the content can be different. It just has to be valid with respect to the current blockchain. So what will the other miners do with my block? That they will include your block into the water tree and then see, well, have you... Uh, double spend, like have you included two transactions which don't make any sense? Or for example, what if this voter block votes on <coughs> this proposal block also? I mean, suppose this voter block has already cast its vote here. Mm -hmm. Then if this pro voter block again cast the vote here, then it's an invalid block. And it's, it's it can be checked by the other nodes. So it's just going to check these simple validity rules. But the content is, is your choice, like Bitcoin. Okay, then if it's okay, I'll take a, a small little 
interlude here. I think the questions are good. I'd be happy to let them continue. But uh, it was there was the possum. It was this event was announced by the IEEE information theory guys to that group, and it's uh, as being co-sponsored. So we need to check just in case they decide to to count it as a formal event, how many IEEE members are here. So if you're willing to list, <laughs> if you're an IEEE member, one, two, three, four, five, six. Great. Well, you're not six. IEEE? <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> what about you guys? This <laughs> people is not IEEE. Uh, I, I, just right now. I got a keychain. Um, <laughs> well, uh, so just to be clear, no, now, on that well. topic, we have we have talked about when you finish and proof of stake work that uh, you would talk to that there would be an event sponsored by this, you know, information theory chapter, I triple information theory chapter, yes. possibly at Stanford. So yeah, it would be really nice if that event okay. you could be an IEEE member. You need to have a proof that you're an IEEE member. Well, it's a tattoo, I believe. <laughs> no, we, yes, a tattoo would be really nice okay. on your forearm right there. <laughs> but it, we also are fairly easy going, I think, in the in the <laughs> there. I think that they might accept it if you, you know, it's kind of self-verified. Okay. So it's. Maybe instead of buying pizza, you can pay the twenty dollars. I, I don't know. I mean, then you get members. So, Vivek, tell me, tell me, do you need to be subsidized for an IEEE membership? <laughs> I'm just amazing. I'm amazing. Okay. Can we help him get it? Okay. Okay. And so, since we're on this topic, do you mind giving us a, uh, a comment on how your proof of stake stuff is going, or maybe just just help people? Maybe you could. You know, do you have like a sentence or two that you can share with us on what you're doing? Uh, so, if you see this, <coughs> the proof of work and proof of stake are just two different ways of preventing civil, it's, it's to control civil attacks. So if you have a proof of stake uh, algorithm which replicates Bitcoin, then using this machinery you can directly plug it here. So the problem is reduced to just finding a proof of stake uh, version of Bitcoin which follows this longest chain policy. And uh, there are many proposals out there, and we are working on one of those, and how to integrate them with this. It always seems, I mean, there's, isn't, isn't the core of it is getting your random number generator? That's right. Secure random number generator? Yes, yes, yes. That's, 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 yeah, it's basically that, and you have to make sure that uh, the keys of your coins are also unbiased. So these are the two problems. Your stake distribution, how your stake evolves, and how your random number is generated. Okay. Like any good Disney movie, there's always a part mm -hmm. two and part three of something. We tell too much right now that people will see that part two. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is so my that's, advisor that's saying we don't talk. That's it for now. <laughs> <laughs> this that next one is the IEEE event. So there we can say anything. Well, <laughs> yes. Yes. I yes. had a question. Hi. Um, so uh, I'm not a cryptographer, I can't argue if this stuff works or not, but my question is, in your mind, if it's working fully optimal, how would this still compare to existing technology such as a gift card or a credit card in speed? Would it be a quarter as quick, one hundredth as quick? Like, because we're, we're, we're not using blockchain as the currency for our project because gift card technology is much faster, but I'm using it for other aspects until it catches up and then I'll, I'll swap it in. And so my question is, how fast is this compared to a gift card? If, if it works optimum. So in the banking industry, when I pay $50, technically the transaction takes three days. It's the bank actually takes the counterparty risk and hence it approves your transactions in five seconds. But if you look at this plot here, you can 
approve this transaction within one minute. And even if you, if you want to go shorter than that, then you have to take a counterparty risk for maybe just one minute. So in that sense, this is actually much faster than the current banking infrastructure. I mean, it's faster, but I could take a gift card right now at Best Buy, <laughs> pay for my stuff and walk out the door, but I've tried to buy Bitcoin before. Oh, because there is no one else. Or Ethereum or, or Litecoin or... The market um, is not efficient, so no, your gift card provider is taking the counterparty risk. But currently the market is not efficient for a bank to take a counterparty risk on Ethereum. And one of the main reasons is because the laws are still not in the place and no one wants to like, start a big business <coughs> based on that. And so how long do you think it would take for the... Yeah, I guess it's as good as well. Well, I mean, there's... <coughs> so you, you, you're, you're asking multiple questions. I mean, there's... I, I, I mean, in general, I, I, I mean, if you if you're trying to get the same level of security as you get with, say, your Visa card, I th and when you say gift card, I guess you probably mean Visa or MasterCard. Well, just, or just the underlying technology. Um, well, again, we're using blockchain in our project in many different ways that most people would in, but just for the payment. And, 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 that, and I was all, originally was gonna use it for the payment method, but I actually got deterred by a friend of mine who owns game credits, because they got robbed for $150 million of their currency and it's gone well, there's no way to get it back but if so rewinding if, just a little bit i mean it's at least possible that you so if if you don't if you are not happy with the vex answer it might be that you would be happier with a state channel as with, with state channel which might be able to give it even faster so yeah uh i mean vivek is giving you a very precise kind of cryptocurrency answer but there might be another another layer which is as good as whatever you're using now, which could be even faster if for some reason what he's doing is not fast enough. Yeah, I think that will But why do we still uh, to save the one fifty million dollar loss? Well I how it will uh, solve this problem. I thought I, I kind of ignored <laughs> that. Oh ah, okay. okay. I didn't, well, okay. I didn't, no, no. I didn't follow that. Yeah, so so that just began the reason why we're uh, I, I got down the road to not use the blockchain as the currency for now but that was an Ethereum-based product. They got an anonymous email from India saying, if you don't give us half a million dollars by tomorrow, we're gonna rob you for more than 100 million. They didn't get that email, then they came to work on Monday, everything was gone. Now you're not getting it back, but I assume if one of you guys in this room found a way to hack Amazon for $50 million worth of gift cards or, or products, they would be able to stop but this. That process. wasn't because the cryptographic solution was broken, right? Yeah, yeah you're no, a it's not. No, 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 no. I, I, I'm, not a, I'm not a cryptographer. Yeah. I'm just saying from a solution. You, you lost the key. Someone stole the key. It's like stealing the, the bank password. No, no, but my, I'm just, again, like, <laughs> I'm not a cryptographer like you guys. But uh, to answer, I, let me throw my hat in the ring. I'd say there are two right. answers. One answer is it's impossible because theoretics behind finality don't exist on blockchain because blockchain is probabilistic unless you go to a uh, you know your own chain of sorts right and then the other answer is three seconds that's a theoretical minimum for like an Ethereum based blockchain to come to uh, consensus not using the current protocol but using other types of consensus algorithms like a I want to say so using the best supercharger for Ethereum it could take three seconds but, but the other answer is it could never be final. <laughs> so it goes from infinity to three seconds, I didn't, somewhere in between. I didn't quite catch if you were trying to blame the $150 million no, no, on not the Ethereum no, no. or not. No. Or, 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 or on, were you, were no, you thinking I'm that was somehow no. connected with the cryptocurrency or were you saying that was a, no, a problem with their security or not? Well, it's definitely that company's security. Um, it's but just, um, no, no, my, I'm not, I, I, I love Ethereum. I invest in Ethereum. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just put that out there. I love Ethereum. Okay. Um, I, I'm just, I'm just uh, not sold on using any blockchain at the moment for our currency. I'm going to use it to make ledgers and to do other things. And we want to open source our earnings over time. So that way when we're public, we're not going to have quarterly earnings. We'll have earnings, not by the second, but as quick as you could possibly dish them out. But I'm just I'm just concerned at the moment with blockchain that it doesn't work as well as just a gift or credit card. And so, from my layman perspective, I'm asking you guys: Am I wrong, or when will it be working as good as a credit card? 
for the UI UX. They had an 850 million dollar problem with one of the cryptocurrency. <laughs> so uh, there are still it's problems. Here. It's, it's a lot of problems. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> a lot. <laughs> and, and the result, maybe this is why Bitcoin is now going up yeah. and uh, Ethereum goes up <laughs> because of the 850 million dollar problem. Let's uh, let's see if we can get back. To <laughs> guys, 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 let's let's uh, let's aim. To questions specific to Vivek for a minute here, please. Let's let's go to. We, I think sorry, at least sorry. part of the answer is is scalability, and Vivek's work here is answering at least part of that. Let's stick to questions related to to the current work, please. Do you have any currently working code or simulated code on GitHub or anything? Yeah, we are actually <coughs> working on a proof of concept, uh, and. Yeah, we, we get performance okay. very similar uh, to the ones. What's your best t transactions per per second right now with that? Best we have is seven thousand, eight thousand. That's okay. That's just close to Visa. Yeah. Yeah, but you want to because you're not still using the whole bandwidth. Right, right. But it's just in a prototype phase, okay. and it could go by a factor of ten more. Is, is it live? Sorry, it's not live. It's, it's just not live. I'll say this is proof of work. So yeah. Don't. <coughs> yes. So let's say all of us here are building the transaction blocks. Yeah. Block pool business. <coughs> yeah. Uh, so are we supposed to broadcast into everybody else? Yes. How often that happens? The, <coughs> the moment is there. The moment you mine a block, you broadcast. Broadcast. Mm -hmm. What is the incentive? You get you, you get the transaction fees. So if I pay you, if I pay Chris 10 Bitcoin, I'll have 0.1 transaction fees. And if you include that in your block, okay. you get to keep that 0.1 Bitcoin. Okay, guys, because we're, we've are we went a little bit long, let's just take one more question, Is that, if that's okay. And I think, um, hopefully, you'll be around this yeah. to answer questions. Our goal is we do <coughs> 8 o'clock with joy. So we're going to, I apologize for cutting the questions a little bit short, but let's let's get uh, one more question and then we'll conclude. Do you envision um, doing some sort of like ICO or something like that? With, with a new blockchain? With oh. this technology? No, no such. Some yeah. version of IEO or whatever. I don't even know what I use. But <laughs> 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 so just get Ethereum address. You could <laughs> <laughs> well, and so like, are you going to try like when you want like? Is this like? Yeah. Are you planning to like launch a block like in the future launch a blockchain and try to just, like, or is this? Pure yeah, I mean, like we are working on the proof of stake version, and if we think that you know we yeah. solved a lot of problems, then then we might launch one. But this is currently proof of work. That, that's a short answer. Cool. Okay, guys. Uh, thank you very much. It's a pleasure. Lots of questions. Uh, we we look forward to the proof of stake event. Uh, Chris pushes me very hard on that. He wanted me to present proof of stake today. Mm -hmm. but I have to uh, hold no, actually, I think. <laughs> Yeah, I think that we discussed the uh, we had we had this email with discussion with uh, with the I, with the information theory guys, and I was the one who suggested you could possibly present them separately. Okay, you had a mic. So at any rate, we're looking forward to that talk. Uh, so uh, thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Thanks so much. Do we? Have